In this segment, we will meet the challenger in the House of Delegates 100th district race and, once again, the incumbent. The incumbent is the Republican, uh, Bill Wright. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. And the challenger, great to have you, sir. The challenger is the Democrat, Maria Russo. Maria, thank you for being here today. Thank you all so much for having me. Each of you will get a minute for an opening statement, and then uh, we'll reverse the order for the closing statement. In between, uh, Steve Pearson, Bill Stubblefield will have questions for you. Try to keep those answers to two minutes or less. If your name or a policy or something you believe in is invoked during the course of your opponent's discussion, you have the right to respond directly at the conclusion of their uh, statement. We will start now with our uh, opening statements, and for that we'll go with the incumbent Bill Ridenauer. Delegate? Yes, I'm uh, Bill Ridenauer. I'm the current uh, District 100 delegate. I am a retired Marine and a retired defense intelligence officer. Uh, I did strategic counterterrorism and strategic counterintelligence uh, in my defense intelligence career. Um, I decided to run uh, after the 2020 election and really after the 2021 uh, assumption of office uh, by uh, President Biden. Uh, I decided to retire at that time because uh, President Biden had um, begun doing some things relative to Afghanistan and other areas. My, my final position in the Defense Intelligence Agency was as the Chief of Strategic Policy and the Intelligence Directorate, uh, working every crisis uh, policy issue uh, in the, the United States uh, globally. Uh, and we were handling uh, the Afghan crisis, uh, and that was a catastrophe uh, from beginning to end under the Biden regime. Uh, I felt that it was incumbent upon me, based uh, upon my background, uh, based upon what I saw going on in the world, uh, and what I foresaw uh, happening uh, in the United States, to go ahead and try and run for a, a position uh, in the state legislature, because I believe that the state legislature is where uh, the principal check on uh, federal overreach is. So a lot of my campaign is focused on trying to ensure that our state is kept free and focused on uh, those things that are going to increase uh, the quality of life, our economy, uh, and take care of the people of our state. Thank you. Thank you, Delia. And if you could uh, slide your mic in front of you a little bit there. Sure. Thank Thanks. The challenger, Maria Russo. Yes, and thank you all again for having me this morning and for allowing this dialogue. My name is Maria Russo, and I'm running to re represent all people across District 100. The district um, districts were redrawn in 2022, so that district runs from Shepherdstown. It includes Harpers Ferry and Bolivar and stretches up to the mountain and all points in between. I am from Jefferson County. I was born and raised here. I grew up on a small farm just outside of Shepherdstown, and I left West Virginia for college to study public policy. But I came back to West Virginia because I care about the people here and I care about making a difference in my community right here at home. And in my career, I have worked as a Jefferson County Schools um, teacher and coach. I have worked as a public policy strategist, and I currently work at West Virginia Rivers, advocating for clean water policy across the state of West Virginia. My focus is really <coughs> local. I have local roots here, and I want to make sure to take a local focus and show up for my constituents on what matters most to them. So my platform is based on economic development, infrastructure, education, so that we can make sure to support all of the workers, teachers, families, young people across District 100. Thank you, Maria. Thank and you. now with now the first question, question, Steve Pearson. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> so um, um, both, both of you, of you if, if, if you're if successful, you're, you're going to be taking a job, job outside, outside of, of um, the Eastern Panhandle. Panhandle. But, 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 but can you tell me can what, tell me what role, role the state, state legislature can play in supporting, in supporting growth, growth of employment opportunities in the, in the Eastern Panhandle? And what, and what types, types of businesses should the, should the state be looking to attract to the Eastern Panhandle? So we'll start with the incumbent, the delegate right now. Well, I believe that the um, role of the uh, – and, and I would take issue with working outside. I, we spend a period of time down in Charleston, but I'm working in the district, so and that's where I'm – constantly going and talking with folks inside of the district. So uh, Fair just, point, in, point. just that issue. Um, as far as growth and employment, I mean, the best thing that we can do within uh, West Virginia and in Jefferson County is to um, increase the business environment to facilitate more businesses coming into uh, West Virginia. The free market is the best means to do that. Uh, at this point, we have 
uh, far too many regulations, licensing requirements in the state of West Virginia, and that carries down to the actual uh, Jefferson County uh, level as well, where there are too many permit requirements, too many regulations. Uh, those inhibit uh, businesses from coming into uh, the state and into the county. Those are things that uh, we are going to try and work on. Uh, I'll be working with Patrick Morrissey when he's our governor uh, to try and increase uh, the um, business environment for all businesses coming in. Uh, I would like us to focus uh, on reducing the size of government, the spending that is going on, the taxes. Once those taxes are reduced, particularly when we get rid of things like the business inventory tax, that will significantly increase uh, businesses' interest in coming into West Virginia. We have a tremendous amount of advantages in West Virginia relative to uh, our uh, power uh, energy uh, production. Uh, we have uh, some of the best coal in the world uh, here, and we're producing quite a bit of power both with coal and natural gas. Uh, that is a significant draw. We al also have access to the Kanawha and to the Ohio rivers. Those are also significant draws for businesses to come into West Virginia. Um, I think we should be looking at any type of business that's interested in coming into West Virginia. Uh, and that, one of the things we may want to do is uh, look at those states which have more onerous regulations or higher taxes and see if we can entice those businesses to coming into West Virginia. However, I do not believe that we should be engaging in the, the type of subsidies that we've seen um, uh, the legislature do in the past. I've opposed those, <clears throat> and I'll continue to oppose those, because we're not in the business, or should not be in the business, of picking winners and losers uh, within the economic system. Uh, we should be trying to use the free market and allow the free market to work it, to its best advantage so that uh, companies that are going to survive on their own can come in and grow. So those are the types of things that I think we should be doing. Thanks. Thank you for this question. I think this is a topic that is at the top of mind for many of my constituents as I'm talking to people, knocking on their doors, discussing this at events. I think economic development is a big um, question as Jefferson <coughs> County grows and as our community continues to change. I really feel like um, what we need to do as a community is focus on our assets that we have here at home. We know that the tourism industry in Jefferson County is very strong. It, within District 100, we have both the downtown area of Shepherdstown and the downtown area of Harper's Ferry. Those are two of the most visited places in um, West Virginia in the region. We have people coming out from D.C., especially right now, as they come out to look at the leaves and look at the beautiful seasons um, that Jefferson County has to offer. And so I think we really need to make sure that we are boosting those tourism opportunities. We have over 7,000 jobs in Jefferson County that go um, that are connected to tourism and so i think we need to make sure to continue supporting those jobs whether it be um, small businesses where people can go to eat or have a drink or um, enjoy the river and the activities that our area has to offer so i think that's a big piece of it i also think there's opportunity to support medium and large size businesses coming in as well as long as they're the right businesses for our community i do think the economic development that we want to see includes a healthy mix across sizes and types of business. Um, we also know that this directly correlates to good paying jobs, and that is a key piece of my platform. I want to make sure that the people of West Virginia do not have to leave our beautiful state to have good paying jobs. We know that many people are leaving to Virginia or Maryland, especially our teachers, to have higher salaries. And I want to make sure in my time um, both campaigning and if elected, to make sure that people have positive work opportunities right here at home and don't have to leave the state for that to be possible. Mr. Stubblefield. Uh, uh, yes. yes. Thank you for joining us today. We have an echo, so I'm hearing itself more so than hearing you right now. Uh, uh, the, the, the distinction between national issues and state issues is fuzzy at the time. Uh, recently, uh, Delegate, you proposed in the last session a House concurrent resolution three, uh, which says West Virginia legislators shall not recognize an illegitimate presidential election. This certainly gets from the state to the national level. Uh, is this a product of a groundswell of your constituents, or what was the purpose of this particular resolution, especially in this polarized environment we have today? 
Well, it, it actually is. I've, I've talked to thousands of um, probably – I've visited at least 8,000 houses now and probably talked to 5,250 or so constituents. And uh, that, uh, together with illegal immigration, which is somewhat related to the issue, um, given uh, the uh, focus of the Democrat Party upon trying to uh, import uh, millions of people into our, our uh, country – uh, and the impacts on our state. Um, this uh, is a, an issue that many, uh, I would say most, constituents have voiced. So, yes, it d is rooted in uh, what my constituents are looking at. Um, the, the issue is, is whether or not we uh, want to allow assassination or imprisonment uh, of the leading political uh, opponent of the current government to um, be a way of selecting our president. It, that should never be a way that we do things. We've seen uh, <clears throat> what assassinations do in the past. You can look at Julius Caesar. Uh, his assassination led to a series of civil wars. Uh, we, we saw with the uh, assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the First World War. Uh, if you look at uh, Spain immediately prior to the Spanish Civil War, the leading monarchist was assassinated, Sotelo. Uh, that led directly to the uh, Spanish Civil War. The, the type of chaos that would ensue from an assassination uh, is hard to imagine. And it's something that we as, as uh, legislators should be focused on. We should be trying to ensure that we are avoiding that type of chaos. Uh, we also don't want the types of political prosecutions that we've seen uh, by, the, by various Democrat entities uh, against uh, the leading candidate. Uh, from the Republican side. This, this is uh, something that we're not seeing uh, from the Republican side against any kind of Democrat. Um, but the second part of my resolution was completely nonpartisan. There was no specification that this was a, uh, that any kind of Democrat party uh, election fraud or election interference would lead to an automatic assumption uh, of a, an illegitimacy. Um, uh, this is, if you look at, the, if you actually read the resolution, if, if you had a, a group of MAGA Republicans who recruited people from Ohio, West Virginia, to go to Pennsylvania, register illegally, vote illegally, flip uh, Pennsylvania to a uh, Trump uh, election, and it was illegitimate in the minds of our Secretary of State or Attorney General, then we would not recognize that either. That, that part is definitely not uh, partisan. Uh, it has been characterized as partisan, principally by those people who automatically assume, uh, unfortunately mostly from the Democrat Party side, that only Democrats would actually engage in election fraud or interference, which uh, that's unfortunate. I wish that they, they were not focused on uh, their own apparent uh, interest in election fraud, that they would actually simply look at the, the election and focus on whether or not an election is legitimate and or illegitimate. Because if we have an illegitimate pre, uh, uh, selection for president, there is going to be problems going forward. Thank Mr. you. Yes, thank you for this question. And I want to make very clear, um, after this resolution was introduced by my opponent, I was sent this resolution um, by many of the people in District 100. I was sent this resolution by people in the state legislature. People were very concerned about the language in this resolution. And so I did make a public statement about this. Because when I read the resolution many times over, I saw that the language was very divisive and very politicized. And I don't think that that's what we need going into this presidential election. I want to make very clear, I worked the polls in Bakerton in 2022. It was a very long day. I spoke about this last night. It was a 15-hour day. You know, the people who work the polls are amazing. They don't eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner. They show up, and it is a very strategic and planned process to make sure that we have bipartisan representation at every single polling place. So I worked at the registration desk to make sure that people were handed out their ballots. And I was working with someone from a different political party to make sure that there was as <coughs> neutral and unbiased as an approach as possible. And so I think we have to instill trust in that process. I think we have to trust that our Secretary of State's office 
is making sure to validate those elections and that the people working the polls are absolutely ensuring our right to a, to vote however we see fit. And I also believe that we should be focused more on local issues. I believe that when we take a national approach, we fail to really pe be paying attention to the issues that I'm hearing from my constituents. So as I knock doors, I'm not hearing about the election uh, fraud or an illegitimate election being a top concern for people. I'm hearing about development. I'm hearing about jobs. I'm hearing about our education system. Those are the topics that I'm hearing from folks, and that's Democrats, independents, and Republicans alike. They really want to see a focus on issues right here at home. So I think what we could be doing as leaders is making sure to instill unity and trust across those political spectrums, making sure that we are taking people's um, perspectives and making sure that our legislation is reflecting that. Mr. Pearson. Uh, yes. So let's Let's uh, shift tack uh, gears a little bit. Um, do you think the state's oversight of environmental issues, particularly stormwater runoff and underground water use, is adequate? What changes would you propose? And let's start off with Ms. Russo. Yes, thank you for this question. And in my career, I have worked in water policy. I've worked at the Capitol in Charleston. Um, I worked to pass House Bill 3189 in 2023, which was the PFAS Protection Act. And so I have worked in a bipartisan fashion to make sure that our water policies are reflective of all people's perspectives. And I think that's so important because when I talk to people at the Capitol, water is not a partisan issue. People want clean water for themselves, for their kids, for their grandkids. And I think that the role that the state has to play is to make sure that we can protect those water resources and ensure clean water for all. That really should be what we're working towards. And so as far as the stormwater permits and other regulations around water management, I think that's a fantastic question. In my experience, I work in water policy, and I think the permits are extremely hard to track. I work very closely with the Department of Environmental Protection on now the implementation of the PFAS Protection Act, and even working closely with DEP, I find it very hard to navigate their systems. And so I think the best thing we could do for the people of West Virginia is make sure that these permits that we have in place that I do think are useful and helpful, that people can access them and really understand what those permits are doing for them. I know that solar is a big topic in Jefferson County, and the stormwater permit came up a lot around the solar project because when there was runoff, extreme runoff from the solar project, the stormwater permit was questioned, and the water quality going from Bullskin Run into the Shenandoah River um, was highly in question. People were very concerned about the color and the sediment of the water and what that meant for the water that they were drinking downstream. And so I think these are incredibly important questions, and I think the state has a critical role to play in protecting those water resources. Could I ask you to repeat the question sure. one more time? I want to make sure I'm addressing it. Um, let me find the question. Do you think the state's oversight of environment, environmental issues, particularly stormwater runoff and underground water use, is adequate? What changes would you propose? Uh, it, it, that's something that we are going to be looking at. Uh, I'm very concerned about what's been going on with the uh, solar fields that are in the Cable Town area of Jefferson County and the potential for uh, pollution going into our aquifer. Um, that, that's something that I intended on bringing up with the, uh, the um, Department of uh, Environmental Protection. I've been in contact with them relative to uh, some of the issues with uh, the solar fields that are in that area. Um, I believe that our permit requirements probably need review. That's one of the principal roles of the uh, state legislature is to review all rules and regulations. Uh, and that's something that we should be um, ensuring that we're doing and making sure that not only are we reviewing those uh, for uh, association with code, but determining whether or not those rules or regulations should be changed via uh, uh, legislation. So I, I want us to try and do a, a better job of looking at how that's being done specifically relative to the solar and to, to some degree the, the wind energy as well, uh, because some of the in, uh, issues that we've seen down in Hardy County uh, relative to uh, wind um, power. So, uh, yes, it, it's a rule for the legislature. It's something that we should be trying to determine um, whether or not we are getting um, 
any kind of pollution. Uh, I've been down to Evitt's Run, uh, down to the Shenandoah, looked at the runoff that's going into the Shenandoah, and I have concerns that we're not only uh, uh, not only relative to our aquifer, but relative to um, the Chesapeake Bay uh, and the potential that West Virginia would be, uh, in fact, sued by the Chesapeake Bay's uh, authorities uh, for uh, issues similar to what we saw in, in the recent past uh, and the economic impacts that those would have on West Virginia. Thank you. Rather than get into another question, which could lead to more elaborate answers, did, did you both had a chance to? Yeah, I was going to say, I could do a follow-up on that one, too, if you want me to. Uh, yeah, if you want to do a quick one, then we'll go to closing yeah. statements. So, so, you know, so, again, this gets to the balancing of economic development, attracting businesses, reducing regulation, and then trying, you know, but also enforcing. Do you think that the environmental regulation should have stricter enforcement? Is it okay for you know, companies, whether it's in the minefields, abandoning a mine or a solar panel, you know, doing runoff? to get a violation notice and nothing happens. We'll just start with you. Absolutely again. not. Um, there's no way that we should, uh, that, that's protection of the people. That, that, um, government's first role is to protect our people, and that's something that uh, we haven't done a, a particularly good job uh, in various areas of West Virginia, uh, and those are the types of things that we do absolutely need to be looking at from an environmental uh, perspective. We have, to, we have roles as legislators um, that allow us to look at these rules, regulations, um, and the, how the uh, departments are functioning to ensure that they're actually doing their job. Um, there are issues, I think, within DEP uh, and with other departments uh, that we need to be looking at. And I, my um, very strong belief is, is that Patrick Morrissey is going to be looking at these to try and make not only greater efficiencies, but far greater effectiveness for all of these uh, departments. So, so. And I believe that um, as far as environmental re regulation, we should have stricter or at least as strict enforcement as we have currently. Um, as I've stated, I work in uh, water policy and making sure we have clean water resources. And I also support people in my job um, reporting violations to DEP. And so that's a critical role that we have for our citizens to be able to report directly to DEP on their web page to say, here's what I see going on in my community, and it helps DEP do their job. As we know, over the last few years, DEP has had staffing um, shortages that has really caused some challenges to make sure that they're in all of the places that they need to be. And so having citizen support on that, citizen oversight for people to say, here's what I see happening, I want to help you, DEP, to address this, that is a critical chain of communication that we have and I absolutely think <coughs> needs to remain. I also think, um, it's going back to the PFAS Protection Act, which I spoke about earlier, this addresses forever chemicals that we have in our water systems. And I think it's a critical bill that we introduced in 2023 and got passed um, across the aisle to make sure that we have community involvement with the writing of PFAS action plans. As you may have heard about PFAS and forever chemicals, this is a huge issue across the country. And I think it's really going to take a multifaceted approach to address this. Um, unfortunately, my opponent did vote against that. He was one of nine no votes out of the 100 member house that did vote against that. And so I really want to make sure that we have more sensible legislation, more bipartisan legislation to address clean water. And I think that that's a top priority in West Virginia. I'd like to address uh, the fact that uh, my opponent has uh, mentioned me in that. Um, I voted against that because at that point we had not seen the Environmental Protection Agency come out with its uh, perspective on PFAS. Uh, I did not think that it was prudent for uh, the West Virginia legislature um, without uh, input from um, the EEP, uh, EPA to go ahead and begin to determine regulations for PFAS. Uh, that's something that I think that the people in uh, the EPA uh, have a uh, better grasp uh, on the types of chemicals that are going into water. So I wanted to see that occur prior to uh, front running, essentially, the EPA. May I respond to that as well? Well, if you can do it in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yes. So there was actually a measure in the bill that said that the state of West Virginia would adopt the measures after EPA took them on. So since then, the Environmental Protection Agency has passed a maximum contamination level, and the state of West Virginia will be in a position to accept that now that EPA has put that out publicly. And just so you guys know, I'm not being rude when I'm texting. I'm communicating with our person back at the station who's running the commercials for us to talk about 
commercial breaks and such. Thanks. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. Uh, we'll go to closing statements now and ask you to do 60 seconds or so on those. And Maria, we will start with you, Maria Russo. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Maria Russo. I'm running for West Virginia House of Delegates in District 100. I am from Jefferson County, and I am an independent thinker running to represent all people of District 100 and the people of Jefferson County. I think that we should have representation that's focused on local issues and that we should be having communications and collaborations across the aisle regardless of political party. That's why I'm focused on local bipartisan issues such as economic development, infrastructure, education, water, as we've discussed today, and other top of mind issues for my community. So if you'd like to be in touch, I'd love to hear from anyone with any questions. Uh, you can reach me at russo4wv.com, and I would love to hear from anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Bill Ridenauer? Yeah, I'm Delegate Bill Ridenauer. I'm, um, my contact information and my webpage is billridenauer4wv.com. Uh, I'm running again for uh, delegate because I believe that uh, I have the qualities uh, that can help not only move our state forward but ensure that we're protecting our state. Uh, we ha are in a very difficult period in our nation's history. Uh, we as state, legislatures, st state legislators have uh, roles within the federal system. Uh, I would encourage people to understand uh, what those roles are and that we uh, do a better job of trying to uh, ensure that folks understand um, how the state government is supposed to function in a federal system. Um, we have significant issues within the state and within uh, the local area, and I'm very focused on those issues as well. I'm certainly not completely focused, as my p opponent has alluded to, uh, on any kind of uh, federal issues exclusively. I am very, very involved in talking to our constituents uh, and finding out what their issues are and dealing with those and trying to resolve those issues locally and uh, do what we can at the state level to ensure that we're actually making the progress that West Virginia should have uh, been making for some time. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. We appreciate it very much, and we wish you the best of luck on Election Day. Thank you. Yep. We are back with more in four.